Welcome to the Fine Cooking Podcast, the show for people who love to cook. I'm your host for today, Sarah Breckenridge. Here at Fine Cooking, we basically live, breathe, and of course, eat all things cooking related. And we love to chat with people who share that passion, whether they're authors in our magazine or experts from around the world. Today, I'm in our virtual studio with my colleagues, Chris Hulk and Diana Andrews. And this is our first podcast since we've been working from home in quarantine, flattening the curve. So I just thought it would be interesting to talk about how our process at the magazine has changed, kind of give you guys an inside peek. As you can imagine, putting out a magazine like Fine Cooking involves usually involves a lot of person-to-person contact. We're tasting, we're cooking, we're photographing. So things have changed quite a bit, and we're just going to chat about that. So welcome, guys. Uh, At this point in all of this, I feel like it's more like fattening the curve, but, you know. (laughs) Right? Uh, I I saw there was a hashtag trending quarantine 15, and I'm like, oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and poor Diana, she is now testing from home and is has become our sole taster. So Diana, first talk a little bit about what our usual process is, and then we can kind of delve into what we've been doing lately. Usually Sunday night, I'm trying to put together a rough schedule as to what we'll be testing that coming week so that while I'm in staff meeting, my shoppers have uh, the recipes on hand so they can create a shopping list. They often spend like the better part of oh yes Monday mm-hmm. afternoon shopping, right? Yeah. Depending on how many recipes are kind of uh, in the hopper and need to go through testing, some of them are cross tests, some of them are retests, some of them are new tests. We could have anywhere from, I don't know, five to sometimes 30 recipes during the course of a week, depending on where we are mm-hmm. with the current issue. And so, yeah, a shopper will spend the better part of a day shopping it is really like a full day's worth of work and it's more than yes. one store usually absolutely absolutely it's multiple stores we kind of can't rely on just one place for right. everything and then anyone who's been shopping these days can now imagine how complicated that's become you know when i started out as an intern at fine cooking part of my responsibility back then was to shop i th- i thought it was kind of crazy that they were going to pay me to shop in a grocery store because I love shopping so much. And I I couldn't believe that I was going to get paid to do this. I'm kind of back in that mode right now because I'm the one who's shopping on Monday. It does take a lot of focus because you really have to know the layout of the markets, what market has what, when to shop, what time of day to go. You could go someplace on a Monday morning and find that they're out of everything. Their produce hasn't come in yet. And another store might be fully stocked with produce by that time. Same thing with meat. So it's kind of like you really have to know the lay of the land. So now you're the sole shopper. And yeah, I mean, I know from experience that shopping has gotten so complicated. So tell me how that's what that's like for you now. I'm sure our our listeners uh, understand because they've been out shopping. And I'm sure you guys too. But yesterday, for example, I went to four different stores. And it was the same situation at every store. And what was once joyful is now kind of depressing. So Monday is mm-hmm. <laughs> Monday is my depressing day. And I feel like it's just overwhelming to have to stand online with a mask on and gloved up and, you know, be led into what was normally just someplace you could enter at any time to go down the aisles and see aisles that are completely empty is devastating. To see the situation over and over three or four times in one day, it just takes it out of you because you realize the severity of what's going on out there and how serious this is. And, you know, I assume like I know that so many people have been having trouble with scheduling grocery deliveries. I assume that's way too unreliable for professional use, right? (laughs) And sometimes even our orders, it's, we have some wholesalers that we deal with and we do order some specialty things from them occasionally. And sometimes those orders aren't fulfilled in the way they should be. So, 
you know, we'll have, we'll have ordered a certain kind of pear, for example, and the delivery comes in the next day and we find out we get apples <laughs> instead. And like, we're all sh- shaking our heads. So, you know, I, I think it would be more frustrating to rely on a delivery service at this point for what, what I'm doing yeah. for testing. Well, especially for you, if you're like going to the store and you're looking for, you know, to find like the best produce that you want to test with or the, the best piece of meat, you're not going to necessarily get that through a delivery service. Absolutely not. Yeah. You know, you're relying then on someone else to pick something for you. And, you know, we're so fussy about what we what we cook with. I mean, especially when we're choosing, let's say, a piece of meat and it has to fit a certain criteria. It has to be a certain weight. Uh, has to be a certain shape. I mean, it's it's all because, you know, that's kind of how we ensure that our subscribers are really getting the, the 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 quality recipes that we kind of, you know, that's our backbone is of the magazine is the quality recipes that we deliver. So in order to assure that, I mean, every shopper now is trained, you know, if you don't find it in one store, go to another store and look for it. And then if you go to one store and you see something that looks kind of like what you need, buy it. And if you end up in some other place after that and you see exactly what you need, buy it. Because, you know, we'll use the meat at some point. And we do donate to a local food pantry for overflow stuff. But this is the way we can assure that our recipes work, that if we're true to the kinds of things, the items that we're describing that we know that the recipes are going to work the way we want them to. Right. So as someone who's probably done more in-person shopping than the average consumer, Diana, do you have any tips now for people that are shopping for their own home during this time? And like, for instance, I keep hearing there's going to be a meat shortage and you know, are you stocking up? No, you know what? Honestly, I swear to you, I have been in multiple stores and everyone is well stocked with meat. I think you have to kind of get to know the personality of the store itself. I mean, I have access to a lot of different stores here. I'm lucky enough to live in a city. So I'm in Stanford and I I can just drive over the New York border if I need to and and shop for, you know, Asian ingredients Mm -hmm. and an H Mart or something like that. But I feel like, you know, I'm, you know, the lay of the land, you know, that Monday morning, don't go to Fairway Mm -hmm. for produce, you go to Whole Foods, you know, Monday early afternoon, Whole Foods is fully stocked with produce Monday early afternoon and Fairway has nothing. So it depends on how much you want to depress yourself. I mean, <laughs> I feel like I'm starting now to take mental notes on to what, when to go where for what, but I feel, I feel like the meat has been pretty full on. So do you think Monday is the best day to shop? No, I think probably Tuesday morning is the best mm. time to shop, at least down here. Okay, so let's move on to testing. So normally, um, when we test recipes, we all gather in the test kitchen around three o'clock and the whole editorial staff and sometimes extra people are tasting the recipes, weighing in on them, giving our feedback. And obviously that's no longer happening. Let's hear about how it's working these days. So right now, testing is going on full steam ahead and tasting is not only done by me, but whoever is in the house at the time. And that might be uh, my boyfriend, his kids. I also have uh, one of my very regular testers lives in the next town. And so usually I'll kind of pack up some stuff and, and drop it off and ask for her opinion as well. But in this case, I do take really diligent notes and try to keep an open mind even though I may want a little bit more of something in a recipe or a little less of something. I mean, I try to keep a broad outlook as to everybody else's palate out there. So I I am taking a lot of additional notes, trying to describe not only through images that I'm taking during the course of of, uh, prep, you know, how the food looks, how it tastes, what I think it could use for garnish, if it definitely needs more salt. So a lot of generalities, but also, you know, do the portions work? Do we need more of something? Do we need less of something? You know, what is the point of this, you know, this recipe? What is the feature trying to say? You know, so these things, I try to give a lot of details and then leave it up to the discretion of the editors who usually come to tasting, who are reading my notes and looking at the images. So now instead of maybe one or two images, I'll take images of my misesing of all the ingredients. I'll take images of, uh, 
the ingredients in the pot or pan or slow cooker, take images of the processes, uh, cooking right. stages uh, to final a dish of how it looks in the pan and then plated. So it's multiple images to try to describe in the best way I can to everybody else on staff who can't be in my kitchen, you know, what the, what recipes are turning out to look like. As somebody who's, who's also doing editing of recipes, I actually really appreciate the depth and breadth of the notes that you're taking at this point. Um, because, there's so much feedback that goes on during a tasting. It's not just sampling what you've made, but we're talking about, you know, is the recipe, can the directions be clearer, you know? Um, so you're, you're doing uh, above and beyond right now. <laughs> it's, what, do you think you'll be able to break out of that when this is over? <laughs> There's so much stuff that goes through the test kitchen in the course of one week that, um, you know, people tend to forget uh, what things taste like. And I know we have our testing notes to uh, rely on, but uh, when they're more formalized and they're more detailed and more images, it kind of reminds you of what something tasted like. I mean, something that you tasted today versus a week ago, you know. So I think the more detailed notes will bring back um, uh, a memory, a food memory. Um, yeah. That might, you know, uh, oh, yeah, I remember this needed this garnish or need more heat because of this. You know, so I, I don't I wouldn't mind going forward this way. Um, of course, it's a lot more work, but OK. I mean, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. if people like this new work method, it's fine with me. That said, I mean, there's something I feel like tasting it really can't be replaced. And Chris, I'm curious if you feel this, because since I've actually been working from home, you know, for mostly working from home for a couple of years now, since I moved to New Jersey, I feel that the days I I actually get to go to a tasting and the dishes that I taste on those days, I have such a better memory of. I'll, you know, I tend to recommend them more when I'm doing the, like the daily e-letter, for example. (laughs) I'm curious, Chris, if you feel like you have less of a connection to the recipes now that you're not tasting them. Slightly, but, you know, there are things that come through and, and maybe it's the just the privileged seat of, of being able to see the recipes before we actually publish them. But there are things that, you know, even though I know they're in, ta- in testing, I've looked at a couple things and thought, oh, you know, I'm going to make that. Just see how it turns out. It looks mm-hmm. really good, you know. That's exactly right, Chris, because as an editor, you, you'll you'll always see the recipe. And if you're really curious and or need to know, you can always try it out yourself. Yeah. I mean, right now, we're th- the ones that, that have really piqued my interest are um, we have a, a bunch of alcohol flexible drinks uh, recipes that just came in from Jill Silverman Huff, who's our pairing editor. So she created a collection of of drinks that can be both mocktails and cocktails and they all look really good (laughs) they do i'm starting to test those this week and i i don't see not one thing wrong with them adding the alcohol will just take it to um (laughs) a a different level obviously yeah but they they seem to be i I mean i could see that they're going to work without the alcohol too and it's really nice to look forward to a feature like this yeah i've in in quarantine, I've I've, be, <laughs> I've become it's all cocktails in I, quarantine. It is, it really <laughs> is. I've not never been much of a cocktail drinker, and in quarantine, I think it was the first uh, weekend that that we were supposed to not go out anywhere, and I got up the cocktail shaker that I hadn't used in probably like fifteen years, and I was like, well, I guess it's time. <laughs> but I've really been kind of having fun rediscovering the whole cocktail thing. Otherwise for me, it's typically just a beer. So, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I've, I've been making margaritas and, you know, nobody in the house is complaining about that. So (laughs) that's good. (laughs) So Diana, how does it feel now to be testing all the recipes in your home as opposed to a busy test kitchen? Well, I have to say, I really, really miss everybody. This is like the heart and soul of my day of being with these people and everyone is really in sync with each other, which is really cool. But the one thing I have to say about cooking at home is that it's become almost Zen-like. It's almost a meditation for me right now, because usually when I'm in the test kitchen, 
there may be on any given day there's three to four other testers working and coming in to ask into my kitchen to ask me questions about something. Or, Can you come and look at this? Is this right? Or something's going wrong. That's kind of interrupts what I'm doing and not in a bad way. I don't, I don't mean it to sound that way, but it's sort of like, you know, you leave the focus of what you're doing and go enter somebody else's uh, workflow, trying to figure out solutions to things. And then your my responsibility is to come back and pick up the thread that I dropped when I ran into somebody else's kitchen to help them out. So it's kind of become this Zen thing for me where I can actually start and finish, like take it right through to the end and take a breath. Oh, I know what you're talking about because you and I have switched places because I used to be working from home in an empty house. And now I have two young kids who are <laughs> each doing remote learning. And like it's every five seconds, it's like, mom. <laughs> when I do my own development, I do prefer to be in my own kitchen. I really don't like developing in the test kitchen because I just can't, I can't focus right. the way I need to. But I honestly prefer to be in the test kitchen with my colleagues because you're all learning from each other. So you make a mistake about something. Okay, you learn something. Maybe you learn a tip that you could put in a recipe. Don't do this. Or uh, instead of this, do that. And I also miss the camaraderie of just being around people. And of course, Chris's baked goods. <laughs> I swear to you, I lost five pounds from not having your baked goods. (laughs) That's crazy. (laughs) I'm losing weight not being in the test kitchen because, you know, Chris is our our resident baker and I really miss your baked goods, Chris. Oh, boy. I miss sharing baked goods. It's hard with, you know, just three of us in the house right now because I can't really bake for just, we can't get through a batch of cookies Mm -hmm. or a cake or anything. So, Chris, how are you finding working from home otherwise? It, there, there are definitely pluses and minuses. I can have music on all day, which is great. Um, <laughs> but the process for me has been slower. It, it takes me probably like 25 to 30 percent longer to do most of the stuff that I'm doing um, remotely. So I mean, typically I'm sitting like one desk over from from Jody, our art director. And obviously I can't just get up and walk over to her desk and say, what do you think about this? Or can we have a little more room for that? Or right. Just having that kind of direct communication, I, I miss that. So, so yeah, I mean, even just getting the last issue out the door, Chris, must have been completely different. I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of, of closing the issue, but I know it's all kind of in your lap and it was a complete change from our usual process. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely more challenging to finish issue 165. I mean, even... The you know, deadline is typically a little crazy, but this one was crazy in a different way. But we got it done and, you know, it was a learning experience. And I, I don't think I'm experiencing any like work from home epiphanies or or realizations that the rest of the world hasn't figured out, especially you, Sarah. I mean, you've been doing this for a while. I mean, you know, you train yourself to avoid the distractions. And, you know, I think you have to remind yourself that, just because your workstation is there doesn't mean you necessarily have to sit down and work. You need to draw lines and have exactly. limits. So, do you think any of the the processes we put in place for this last issue will keep using once we go once we're back in the office? The only thing I, I can speak for myself in terms of that is that previously when I worked from home, it was a little burdensome. Our, our technology wasn't quite as robust mm-hmm. as it needed to be for that to be successful. And we've made some changes with that, that at least from, from my end, makes it a lot easier to work from home. And Diana, you were saying you think you could even potentially test from home in the future, right? You know, if I had to, absolutely. You have access to your work tools at any given moment. And that's kind of uh, a blessing (laughs) and a curse, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. That's something I've discovered a while ago. (laughs) So just personally, what do you think you will um, take away from this time with like, what changes do you think might be in your life from this time? I I feel like I've become uh, really, really more aware of and, and it, not that I was unaware of food waste, but I hate to waste anything now. I think I'm shopping smarter and cooking smarter. So I think these are good things. Because I've had this conversation with friends who don't actually work in, in this food publishing business. But, you know, I start digging through my pantry and I'm like, 
what the hell is that? How long is that? <laughs> and how can I use it? <laughs> can I still use that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I agree. I feel the same way about being super thrifty with cooking. And I think it's made me a better cook. Like I, I saved the juices from a roast chicken, you know, that I wasn't using that night and used them two nights later in a pot pie, you know, which made it so much more flavorful, like all mm -hmm. these little things that, that actually improve the cooking. So. Like everyone else, I started a <laughs> sourdough starter and mm -hmm. when I started just doing the reading and, and how to do it, I, I kept looking at, at the instructions, you know, throw away half of it and save the rest. And I kept thinking, why would you throw that away? I mean, you know, you can't throw away flour right now. And I discovered there are a bunch of sources online, including King Arthur Flour, that have fantastic collections of recipes for using sourdough mm -hmm. discard. You know, it, it is painful to throw away the discard, isn't it? Oh it's my really gosh. painful. Well, King Arthur has a great uh, waffle and pancake recipe that uses sourdough discard. So, you know, I revived my sourdough starter too, you know, Chris, and I yeah. actually started a new one as well. Your original one is so good. Oh yeah. I got that from one of our food stylists to begin with, uh, Chad Robertson from Tartine, but that's his original starter. Wow. She got some from him and she's cultivated it along and named it and everything. And <laughs> people get a little crazy with the starters. But, you know, I have to say that I've, I've devoted myself to, to tackling not only the food waste thing, that's really important to me, but I've really given myself like um, a moment to try recipes that I've been putting on the back burner and that I never <laughs> get to. So now, you know what I want to do with this, uh, the sourdough starter? Chris, the discard. Uh -huh. I am. I'm gonna put it into a pasta. I'm gonna make yeah. pasta with it. That's like sort of in my on my back burner. But before that is gonna be soup dumplings. Mm -hmm. I think it's just slowing down a little bit. I think that's what I've taken away from this. <laughs> and I think you just have to take a moment to try to appreciate some things in your life that aren't so readily available to you now. You're still healthy. Everybody in the house is still healthy. You know, you still have food. Let's take a breath and try to get through this yeah. together. We're all in this together. It's not just us here, but it's a global thing, which it doesn't make it better, but it kind of makes it a little more bearable. Don't you think? Yeah, that is so true. And I hope everybody at home is having these same revelations about cooking and slowing down. And it is really important. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening and stay safe, stay healthy. Be sure to subscribe to Fine Cooking Magazine. Visit us at finecooking.com. Follow us on Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, and Facebook, where you can join our Fine Cooking podcast group. <laughs>